thank you one and all for joining us this evening or well, this evening for you this morning for me it's monday morning here down under but uh, we thank you for joining us and and i want to thank the christians at the midland park gospel hall for inviting me to come along and share the gospel with you what a tremendous privilege that we have right from the other side of the world but as david has said we're going to preach from the same bible about the same savior the savior that i have come to trust and know and i want to recommend him to you tonight through the preaching of the gospel that you too may come to trust him by faith jesus christ the lord and that you might not only trust him by faith but uh, you might experience the joys of sins forgiven and the gift of god eternal life now we're going to read from the bible so if you have a bible turn with me please to the very first book of the bible and i'm going to read some select verses this evening if you don't have a bible just listen along carefully and uh, if you want these verses afterwards to read then you can go to the recording no doubt but uh, this this is such a fundamental part of the gospel preaching when we preach the gospel we do not express our own opinions this is not the this is not the opinions of the of the midland park gospel hall or the christians that go to the, that attend the gospel hall there this comes directly from god himself and so we we want to reiterate that at the beginning of the meeting so that you understand that as we read the bible this is god's word so the very first chapter of the first book genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and it simply reads this in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth a very simple verse but i will read it again in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth now come with me to the new testament that's the second part of the bible to romans chapter one the new testament romans chapter one and we're going to read a few verses from here beginning at verse number 16 romans 1 verse 16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. That's the Gentile. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of god is manifest in them for god hath shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and godhead so that they are without excuse because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four footed animals and creeping things therefore god also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of god for a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever for this reason god gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature likewise the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one for another men with men committing that which is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due 
And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not con convenient or not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness and sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. A very, very solemn reading from God's word, but a very accurate reading it's accurate of course because it is god's word but you would have thought that we have read something that has just been penned in the 21st century but this was penned 2000 years ago but aptly describing the human race now i have one further reading before we speak on all of these things and that is in hebrews chapter 1 hebrews Chapter one, just a bit further on in the Bible. Hebrews one, verse one, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high now we've read these verses particularly i have selected them particularly this in uh, uh, go over the verses that we've read together and read them again and read for yourself uh, these things and read the word of god it's imperative that you understand that what we preach to you on this webinar what we preach to you on this forum is from god himself we are just mouthpieces we are messengers for god we have god's word the bible we've come to know him by faith through the lord jesus christ which we will explain tonight and we are now passing on this message of the gospel passing on the message of good news to you now recently i have been considering in my own mind various questions and speaking to people in relation to various questions that they have and there are questions that abound across this world in relation to god and in relation to the gospel why do we need god or why is there suffering in the world in which we live why is there death what is death where did it come from how did it come about what does it mean to be human what is good is there an absolute when it comes to good who is jesus and why does it matter you may have reflected on some of these questions in the past yourself but i want to particularly select a question this evening to focus on and the question i want to focus on this evening is who is god who is god now i guess from the outset i, I would I, it's it, necessary that i put a disclaimer out at this point just just to make sure that you know that we cannot fully comprehend who god is god is infinite and if we could fully grasp who god is then i guess we would be god but we cannot and but we have some sufficient information as to who god is and he has revealed himself to us in the Bible. And when we open the Bible, the very first page of the Bible, that's why I wanted to read in Genesis chapter one, because the very opening statement of the Bible. It states God for who he is. 
he is our creator. And there are really four points I want to make in relation to who is God or this question, who is God? Number one, he is a creator God. He is our creator. Number two, we want to see tonight that he is in control, even in the, the midst of the confusion that abounds on planet Earth. God is in control. I want you to see this evening how that he is a compassionate God. Who is God? He is compassionate. And I want you to also see that he is Christ. Christ is God. Jesus Christ, the Lord, is none less than the eternal God. And I trust that by the end of this little session together, you will grasp something of that and you will put your confidence in Christ as the Lord. Now, some of these things may run contrary to your humanistic view of God, because we live in a world where there are all types of humanistic views of as, as to who God is. But I'm very thankful again. I come back to this fundamental point that we have the Bible to iron out our mindset. And that's what I needed plainly. There was a time in my life that I really had a God of my own imagination. In fact, the God of my imagination really, really was subject to me. I could tell him what to do. I could live my life the way I wanted to. And then he will accept me into his heaven based upon my my theology or my grounds and and the way I wanted things. And, you know, I could kind of tell God that I've done more good than bad and and and, and influence in him in this way. And he would accept me in and, and all would be well for eternity. Well, that really was a God of my imagination. In fact, as I as I became convicted about my sin approximately 20 years ago, uh, I I. I I began to worry about meeting God because I began to think about my sin and realize, realize that not all is well. And I began to fear meeting God. And I remember at one point actually saying to myself, well, when I see God, I'll just tell him I never read the Bible. Again, that's a God of my imagination. That's a God whom I can tell what to do or I can pull the wool over his eyes and somehow he will be fooled by this. And and I can kind of squirm my way into heaven and, and nothing will be said. Well, my friends, that's a humanistic view of who God is. That was my own imagination. And it actually made me God because I was the one in control here. But I had to come to realize, as you have to come to realize, that is not who God is. God, my friend, is in supreme control. He is our creator. In fact, that is actually the definition of repentance. Repentance is to change our mind. We come into a line with what God says about himself. So it's not that we arrive in heaven because of our view of God or our We've come to agreement with what God has said. We have turned and we come to agree with God. And that is the definition of repentance. My mind is changed and I come into alignment with what God says about himself. But I want to think, first of all, how God is our creator. Just consider with me for a moment the material world in which we live. And I'm going to I'm going to use something here. I'm going to contrast or I'm going to compare the material world and the and the natural world in which we live. But think of the material world in which we live for a moment, the clothes that we wear, the houses that we live in, the streets that we walk, the cars that we drive, the, the very screen that I'm looking in. You would have to agree with me that this is all a product of careful thought and meticulous design and plainly engineering genius. I, I stand in awe of, of the, the minds of men and women who construct, who think, and invent and construct and engineer such such wonderful uh, products and materials that we, that uh, that we that we use today. So you would agree with me that this is this is a product of careful thought. Now I want you to consider just the natural world in which we live, Earth that travels through space at 
67,000 miles an hour around the sun. Just incredible to think that in the last hour, you're 67,000 miles further away. You know, it, it, we, we hardly realize these things as we sit on this desk chair in my office here, wherever you may be listening. Depending where you are on the globe, this globe spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, rushing through space, just extraordinary as it circumnavigates night and day, unwavering. It's morning here in Melbourne. It's, it's moving to the evening there in New York or New Jersey, where you are, wherever you may be listening. Night and day, unwavering. The seasons, predictable, that come and go. I was just speaking to the host before we came on and telling him of the, of the autumn season that has arrived for us here down under and the leaves are falling off the tree. It's moving into spring and summer where you are. You think of the grasses and the herbs and the trees, the seeds germinating. You think of the gravitational pull of the moon and the tides controlled by these things and the sun being the perfect distance from Earth and the planets fixed in space and stars that have guided millions as they've moved across deserts and wherever it may be. Now, I want to just ask you about these things. I, I want you to think about these things for a moment. Think of the various species of animals in the natural world in which we live. Now, just coming back to the, the material world for a moment, if I was to suggest to you the material world is not a product of careful thought or meticulous design or engineering, but it is the result of random chance happenings. And, and, the, and the building that I'm sitting in here is just the consequence of an explosion in a, it, 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 let's just say, in a hardware store 20 million years ago. I think if I, if I came with such theory to you, 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 you would rightly maybe confine me to some institution. Imagine if I went on national television to, in all seriousness, uh, give my theory of this real world, you know, uh, the book here that I'm holding in my hand, the screen that I, I'm looking into, it, it's, it's not the product of human uh, intervention or invention or, or, or human genius. This is, this, is just, this is just the result of random chance happenings and everything has just fallen together. I think quite rightly you would disagree with me. Yet the natural world, you know, those things that I just mentioned to you before, night and day, the seasons, the grasses, the herbs, the trees, all growing in the right direction, producing fruit at the right time. The sun shines, the rain comes down, the, 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 the trees grow up, the fruit is produced, seasons that take place. They are the first described for us in the first three days of creation. I mentioned the fourth day of creation, too, in relation to the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars. But, uh, but my friends, we live in a world where the theory of evolution is, is set forth right across this globe, that we are the result of some chemical explosion 13 billion years ago or something like that. And yet we look at the natural, we look at the material world, and, and we would say that that it is an absolute impossibility. Yet think about the natural world. It is equally an impossibility. How could it be that everything fell into place by sheer luck? That this world is a is a, a result of blind, undirected process of random selection. No, my friends. I want to set forth to you in this gospel meeting truth, fact, fact that can be relied upon. In fact, truth that you can stake your eternity on. And that is, who is God? He is a creator God.
He is our creator. He has designed us. He has made us. You think of the, the incredible genius of the human body. One piece of flesh the size of a postage stamp requires three million cells, three feet of blood vessels, 12 feet of nerve endings, 100 sweat glands, 15 oil glands, 25 nerve endings in just a, a piece the size of a, of a postage stamp. If you know what they are in the day of computers that we live and emails. But my friends, no, we are not the result of of random selection. But we have a God, a God whom we're answerable to. And that's what we want to stress in this meeting to you, that you are answerable to God. You cannot evade him. He is your creator. You will meet him. And you're answerable for your life. You're answerable for your sin. And it should cause you to tremble, my friend. That you're going to meet God. And you're answerable for your sin before God. What is the reason that this world has attempted to block God out? We, we attempt to block him out of our thoughts. We attempt to block him out of our lives. We block him out in the th with the theories of mankind. He's blocked out of schools. The world tries to block God out of every sphere. But my friend, we want to reiterate to you tonight the reason for this is what we read in Romans chapter one. It says that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. You know, it's an amazing truth that every single person on this call knows that there is a God. The very reason that we are here having this gospel meeting, the very reason, my friend, that you even think about these things. It's a manifestation of the knowledge of God within you. This is what the Bible teaches us in Romans chapter one. Go back over those verses, read them again and again. If as soon as you get off this call, read through those verses. Take time to think about these things. But it teaches us there that they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but, but became vain in their imaginations. And our foolish hearts were darkened. We changed or exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And we worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Isn't that true of the Western world, the world in which you find yourself a part of tonight? You think of the great city of New York. No time for God. People rushing about their business. Wherever you may find yourself located, it told, it told us in verse 28 of that chapter that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And that is society in which we live. And could I suggest to you tonight, my friend, that has been your problem. You've tried to block God out or you've tried to bring in a God of your imagination. Oh, the terrible result of this. We read those details, which I, I hardly like to go over, but I must because they're stated for us plainly in, in the word of God, the Bible. How that the result of blocking God from our lives, the result of not liking, not, not wanting to retain him in our knowledge, the result of professing ourselves to be wise, but actually becoming fools is that we are filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. Isn't this the society in which we find ourselves a part of? Sexual immorality is rampant in the society in which we live. Envy, murder, strife, deceit, haters of God, violent, proud, disobedient to parents. Can you fit yourself into this? Can you acknowledge that you are part of this and that that this is all a result of human sin? It's a result of the fact that the human race has turned their back upon God. But my friend, the sin in your life. And you know the details of it. I don't. 
You know the details of the sin in your life. It's a result of having turned your back upon God. And we are degenerating. We're certainly not evolving. And the Bible sadly has to state for us in the third chapter of that book that we read, Romans, that there is none righteous. No, not one. That's where we must come to in relation to our God. We are not righteous. We are not right before God. And the catastrophic effect of human sin has wreaked havoc upon planet Earth. And it has ruined the human race and wrecked your own life. I'm speaking to you tonight and you have the burden and guilt of sin upon you. It's taking you in a wrong direction. It's leading you to eternal death. But I ask the question tonight. In the midst of all this havoc, has God lost control? No. You see, that's why I wanted to read to you. Hebrews chapter one. Again, you can go over these verses and many other verses in the Bible, some of which we'll quote this evening. But you can read, my friends, we read in the Bible that from the very beginning, although God righteously, I must say, righteously placed mankind under the sentence of death, for that's what we deserve. We deserve to be separated, separated Death is not only separation from one another, but it's separated from God into righteous judgment for eternity, which the Bible reveals for us as being the lake of fire. He justifiably sentenced mankind under death and placed the curse upon the creation. That's why this world is in such confusion tonight. You want to know even why the natural world? It is in such a mess because of human sin. The rivers don't pollute themselves. Human sin has left a stain across this planet and God had to place a curse upon creation. But I want to tell you, my friend, from the very beginning, you open the very first chapters of your Bible and you read the creation story. You read the creation account. How that God constructed this world with meticulous design and genius, the omniscient genius of our God, our creator God. But you read in chapter three of Genesis, just three chapters into the Bible of how sin came into the world. But I want to gladly tell you tonight, my friend, that the moment sin came into this world, God began immediately to communicate to humanity his plan for salvation, his plan to rescue fallen mankind. And that's why I read to you in Hebrews chapter one. You can read it in Genesis two. You'll read about the seed of the woman coming to crush the head of the serpent. The seed of the woman is Christ who's coming to crush the head of the serpent, which is Satan, to put an end to Satan's plans. And aspirations. But in Hebrews chapter one, we read that God in various times and in various ways, he spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. And that's the Old Testament scriptures. If you take the Bible and you go from Genesis to Malachi, you will read prophecy after prophecy and if, if you're not sure where some of these scriptures are and you want to know you can either uh, get in contact with me via the host or go back to the person that invite you invited you to this meeting no doubt a christian and and ask them about these verses but we read in the old testament hundreds and hundreds of prophecies concerning the the coming of christ into this world god's plan for salvation God's plan to rescue guilty sinners. This is this is an, a, a, a good way of understanding the word gospel, G-O-S-P-E-L. God offers sinful people eternal life. That's what God wants to do for you tonight on this little forum. And we read in the Bible how that Christ would come into this world, the very son of God. We'll see a bit more about that in a moment. But we read in Old Testament prophecies where he would come to. 
he would come to Bethlehem. And how he would come, he would come through the virgin womb of Mary. And what he would do, and we read in the Bible how that he would come to preach good tidings to the poor. He would heal the broken hearted. He would proclaim liberty to the captives. That's captives of sin like you, my friend. He can free you from your sin. You know, he's freed me from my sin. As I said before, 19 years ago, he freed me from my sin at the side of a road because of what he had accomplished at the cross, which I'll explain in a moment. But he would open the prison to those who are bound. We're bound by sin. This this human race, the world in which we live now, after 6000 years of recorded human history, has proved one point. And that one point that this world has proved after 6,000 years of human history is that we cannot deal with this problem of sin in our own strength. No, no. The world just gets worse. Crime rates rise. And yet, my friend, we're here to tell you that there is one who is able to loose you from sin free you from it, grant to you eternal life as opposed to death, eternal death where you are heading. Yes, it took the coming in of God himself to this world. Who is God? He is our creator. He is in full control, even though this world is in such a mess. From a human standpoint, God, he, he knew the mess that sin would create. He knew the havoc that it would wreak upon planet Earth. But he, in the midst of this, designed this plan of salvation to rescue guilty men and women, boys and girls from the midst of the mess of sin. Yes, my friend, in the midst of this mess, God took it upon himself to come into this world in the person of his son to rescue creation. Who is God? He is Christ. Yes, Christ Jesus is none less than God manifest in flesh. God came into this world in human form. Walked the dusty streets of Palestine and of Jerusalem. He went about, it says, doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. What a wonder. The person of God's son, Jesus Christ. He is none less than the creator of the universe in which we find ourselves. And yet he stepped in, stooped in to time. The humble stoop that the son of God took from the throne of God to the manger of Bethlehem. And yet, what was his purpose? What was his mission to go to a cross? Why did the son of God need to go to a cross? That he might bear the just judgment for our sin. My friend, that God. God himself would take upon him the responsibility to deal with our sin. And the son of God. He subjected himself to the wrath of God. Yes, the wonder. The wonder. Of the triune God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Working for the rescue of the human race. Working, my friend, that you could be released from the bondage of sin. And that you could find eternal life. And his mission, Christ's mission. Was to go to a cross and we read in the Bible, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you know that tonight that God loves you? Do you understand that we have a God who is compassionate? He is a creator God. He is in control. He is Christ. But he is compassionate towards your plight. 
He knows exactly where you are this evening. He knows that you're lost in sin. I want to point you back to the cross tonight. This is the very theme of our message. The unparalleled sufferings of the son of God. You know, at the cross 2000 years ago, this world just demonstrated what they thought of God himself. Oh. Ah, my friend, the world in which we live in the 21st century to the first century is no different to the day that they took the son of God and nailed him to a cross. Yes, that method of execution may be long gone upon planet Earth, but the very thought lies still in the human heart to be rid of God. That's what we read in Romans chapter one. And the human heart just demonstrated at the cross of Jesus Christ exactly what they thought of God. But can I tell you there, he was suffering for you, my friend. We read in the Bible again in prophecy, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The Lord laid on him upon Christ the, the judgment for our iniquity. Oh, the, the wonder that the loveliest person to ever grace planet Earth. Was taken outside the city walls of Jerusalem and impaled hand and foot to a cross and upon him was vented every ounce of human hatred. But I tell you, my friend, he was suffering there for you. He was suffering there for me. And when they had lacerated the back of the son of God and impaled him to a cross. The Lord laid on him. The iniquity of us all. Yes, he bore the judgment that I deserve for eternity. He bore the judgment that you deserve for eternity. All for the great purpose, my friend, that he may rescue you, that you may be plucked as a brand from the burnings, that you may be rescued from going down to hell. God's provision of salvation to a ruined human race was Christ to the cross of Calvary. Oh, the wonder of his words. Could I remind you if you've never if you've heard them before, but if you've never heard them before, let me tell you tonight of the words of Christ upon the cross, suffering for your sin, suffering for my sin. He would say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And in the darkness, Abandoned. As a man, Christ experiencing what we truly deserve as the as the human race. God stepped into this world, took upon him a human body and experienced as a man what we deserve. The judgment for human sin fell upon him. And he cried in the darkness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, the wonder that he would take it. But can I tell you, my friend, Christ was able to exhaust the judgment of God, something you could never do. If you die without Christ, if you die in your sins, you will go into eternity. Never, ever being able to exhaust the judgment of God that is righteously upon you. But at the cross, Christ could exhaust the judgment. He could bear what we deserve. And he drank that bitter cup. He was the only one, my friend, who could finish this work in relation to our salvation. He gave up his life in sacrifice. With these words upon his lips, listen to them. The only person in the human race that could ever utter these words. No man takes my life from me. But I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, he could say, and I have the power to take it again. And when he had exhausted the judgment of God at Calvary's cross, he said, it's finished. 
Father, into your hands, I, I commend my spirit. And he dismissed his life in, vol in a voluntary action. He laid it down as a sacrifice, went into death. For well, that's truly what we deserve. But I am thankful to tell you, my friends, that God raised him from the dead. God raised his beloved son. Yes, the mighty power of God was resident that day and he raised his son from the tomb. And we read those words that having made purification for our sins by himself. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I tell you, my friend, who is God? Christ is God. He is the eternal son of the living God. He is the mighty creator. He is in supreme control. Can I tell you, my friends, as I preach to you and as you sit wherever you are, wherever you may be this afternoon, this evening, listening to this. He knows all about you. Christ is on the throne again. He's not in the tomb. He's the living God. He's on the throne of God and he's coming back. Are you ready to meet him? Are you ready to die? Do you have salvation? Do you know that Christ has conquered the forces of hell, destroyed the power of Satan, torn away the bars of death in his resurrection? He paid for it. He paid. He paid for human sin. He bore my sins in his own body on the tree. Do you know him? I'm going to quote a verse of a hymn that was penned many years ago, and I'll finish. All hail the power of Jesus name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all sinners whose love can ne'er forget the wormwood and the gall. Go spread your trophies at his feet and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe. And crown him Lord of all. Yes, my friends, that's my savior who I present to you tonight, who can be your savior. Jesus Christ, the Lord, who accepted the judgment for our sin. And who conquered the grave by rising again. Who's coming again. Who can be your savior. It's urgent that you get to Christ tonight by faith. Just wherever you are as this meeting closes. Speak to him. He's listening out for you. Cry to him for salvation. Put your trust in him. I, I put my trust in him after listening to a gospel message like this, just at the side of a road, sitting in my van here in the city of Melbourne, 19 years ago, winter time. And I asked the Lord Jesus to save me. And true to his word, he did. He's alive. He will save you. The Bible simply says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved.